Hello and welcome to Marketing Speak. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, and today it's my distinct pleasure to have Ava Carmichael with us. Ava is a creator, entrepreneur, brand builder, and fashion designer turned full-time digital marketer. Her clients and colleagues have called her a magician and a marketing unicorn. She uses intuition in every aspect of her life, including business and marketing for her clients. Ava, it's so great to have you on the show. Thank you, Stefan. It's great to be here. So from your bio, it it uh, mentions intuition, and I would love for you to elaborate a bit on that. How do you use intuition uh, in in your marketing and client engagements, and uh, where does where does it come from? Um, well, I think I think some people are kind of born with it. To be honest with you, I think everybody's got it. I don't think everybody listens to it, <laughs> um, but it is it is kind of a for me, it's a three prong um, approach and some of it is instinctual. It's something I feel like I was just born with. Some of it is, you know, I, I read data so I can see what's going on, you know, in trends in the marketplace, you know, and then some of it, I think, is just ex obviously experience. You know, you go through things in your life and you experience, you know, uh, certain business ventures or projects and you can kind of see how how things may play out based on past experiences. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think for me, it's just, I use a lot of different techniques in order to, you know, whatever it is I'm doing, building a brand, building a marketing um, plan for somebody, or I mean, everything really, it's just kind of, it's just, it's part of everything that I do. Yeah. Could you give an example of uh, a case where your intuition saved the day, maybe with a, a, a major client engagement of some sort. Um, I think I think honestly, um, some of it can come from. I guess in this case, and you know, I don't want to mention any clients' names, but um, sometimes sometimes a client can kind of have an idea of what they think their brand is, and then what they want to. I guess the language they want to use out in the open. And sometimes it doesn't really match with the direction they are actually going or I guess where I feel like it would be stronger for them. So I think I've had to, I've had to step in a lot with some of my clients and say, you know, is this part of your brand message or is this, you know, which, which part of this is this? I mean, it, like when you're talking about somebody who has a personal brand or somebody who has products Sometimes the personal brand of who they are hasn't been developed quite yet. And so, you know, it's like putting too much of who you are personally into maybe a product might not be wise until you've gotten the buttoning up of the personal brand mm -hmm. first. So to avoid causing a disaster, you know, like with the product that you're launching, you don't want to have too much of, of maybe the face that's behind the brand yet. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. It's kind of like brand suicide or product suicide by poor branding. <laughs> Got it. Um, I don't know if it was, I don't know if that's actually intuition, but I feel like, I feel like it, there's always something, I guess, inside of me that maybe speaks louder, you know, and, and I think I listen to that more, more or less when I'm doing any kind of business transactions or any kind of um, dealings with clients or, you know, even friends. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So how did you develop your own personal brand and then what kind of lessons and, and, um, skill sets did you then carry over to helping your clients with their brands? Wow. That's interesting. I feel like I've been building my brand for a very long time, um, inadvertently because I think, you know, growing up, we didn't have the internet. And so I think I learned pretty early on that everything I do online is connected to me and that's part of who I am and that's part of my brand. And so I started blogging pretty early and I didn't really do it for anything other than for myself. It wasn't really like to gain any kind of recognition or to actually at the time, I didn't even know I was building any kind of brand at all. I was just blogging. And I would blog about what was either on my mind or what I learned that day 
about a business or whatever it was. It was just kind of a random assortment of thoughts. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think at some point I realized that everything I'm publishing online becomes part an extension of who I am. And I think everybody should understand that you are your brand now, you know, online. And it's like everything you say, everything you do just becomes a part of the way people perceive you. And so, um, you know, I was a fashion designer and then, but I, but that was always felt very separate from who I was because there was a lot of things in line with that fashion industry that I didn't really um, align with, you know, like I didn't, I didn't find it incredibly sustainable. (laughs) You know, it was like, in some ways it kind of started going against everything I truly believed in. And so I think at some point I had to make a decision, you know, am I going to keep doing this or I'm going to go kind of do my own thing? And so I ultimately I kind of chose to go out and do my own thing because a lot of, a lot of the companies I worked for just, they, they were just, it wasn't, it wasn't in alignment with where I was. Mm. And so I think for me building my own brands and kind of going a long way around here, building my own brands because it was so, expensive to do it. I couldn't afford to hire anybody. And so I ended up having to do everything myself. You know, I learned how to do content marketing, you know, to, to, because I mean, fighting press was in, in, it was incredibly difficult. So I'm like, well, I'll just write about my own stuff, my own projects, you know? And then that, you know, the blogs on that side became part of a whole other type of thing. I learned that blogs can be about journaling or they can be about lead generation and content marketing and SEO and, and getting your brand out there and on a whole other level. And so, and so in that way, I learned how to, um, how to just market, you know, digital marketing, you know, just by like trial and error and, you know, running Google ads. I mean, I feel like it's so funny to even talk about it now because I was just so green back then. Um, but as a result of having to do everything myself, I learned how to do it, you know? Right. And on, on your website, you uh, uh, equate yourself to being a nerd, a, a branding and digital marketing nerd. And how how did you come up with that as, as uh, kind of your identity instead of maybe a geek or, uh, you know, wizard or whatever? Like, how how did you end up? Pick a, well, pick a nerd. I think, I think the nerd part is just, it just, I love the word anyways. And it, it doesn't mean anything derogatory. I think it feel like it's just like, you know, I kind of nerd out on analytics, you know, I, I nerd out on the whole right and left brain portion of, of all of it. You know, it's like, I love to think about how, how, how people think, you know, it's like when they land on a page, you know, what makes them buy, you know, I love to understand that you know i love to understand what makes people buy something what makes people connect with a brand you know so there's that part of it you know and then i love reading analytics which if you were to tell me this when i was a child i would have never believed you mm-hmm. because I, I was never a numbers person i was never into data or any of that and then once i once i started looking at the you know, the dashboards of like Google Analytics and and seeing where people were finding this page or, you know, Google Search Console, what terms they were using to search for, you know, and how they found it. It's like, wow, this is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. So I uh, I nerd out on that kind of stuff. Yeah. So hence nerd. Gotcha. (laughs) Yeah. uh, I'm cool with being a geek. I'm, I'm not as much into being a nerd, which is kind of silly because I am a nerd too, but I don't really uh, put myself out there as being a nerd. Actually, this um, uh, the, my other podcast uh, was called The Optimized Geek. I have two shows. Uh, so this one, Marketing Speak, is actually the second one I started. The first one was called The Optimized Geek, and then I changed it not too long ago to Get Yourself Optimized because I thought mm-hmm. that uh, it would maybe turn off some people who didn't self-identify as geeks. Right. And there's a lot of really great personal development stuff on that podcast. I, I wanted people to to get it. So anyways, yeah, yeah. Geeks versus nerds. There's a fun infographic um on online about 
the differences between geeks and nerds. It's uh, it's uh-huh. it's entertaining. Anyway, so I was just curious how you. I'll have to look for it. Yeah, I'll include it I'll in the in the it. show notes of this episode <laughs> for our listener to uh, check out. It's it's fun. So, how did you incorporate fashion design into your business? Because I'm sure you learned some really ninja things in the process of becoming a fashion designer and, and doing that work. And I don't know if mood boards or something was something you did in fashion sure. design, and then you brought over to brand building and digital marketing. How, 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 you know, tell us more about this. I know. I mean, you would think at first glance that like, how do they play together? Like, I, I don't know if they do. I mean, and that's what I've always struggled with myself is, you know, how does that, how do these two play together? But honestly, they do, especially whenever you are kind of that entrepreneur mindset anyways, which I am, I've always been that, that person. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, for me, it's like a brand architecture type. It's like you're building something. So whether you're building somebody's brand or you're building somebody's marketing plan, it's, it's, you're building something, you're building a product. And so with fashion, it was, I was building a line, I was building a brand, I was building a specific product. And so there's, there's a lot of key points that all intersect together for the middle of that one product or brand that you're building. And that includes things like PR, you know, um, brand messaging, you know, everything, the visuals that are all associated with one, one product, one brand, one line, one collection, whatever it may be. It's like, you can even take that part of the middle of that out, whatever that is, and you can replace it with anything else. It doesn't even have to be a collection or product, you know, it's like, it's, it's whatever it is. And so from, in my world, it was fashion, you know, but then I learned that you could take anything and replace that with it. And it's still the same kind of architecture of sorts. And so for me, I love fashion, but it's like, it, it, there was more to it even then than the fashion, I discovered that I might be really good at building a collection, but I'm really good at like marketing and selling it too, like maybe even better. Mm. And so when I realized that, I felt like I was really on to something. And then I, it was a really quick and easy pivot for me because I think I was already ready anyways to, you know, maybe stop working for larger corporations and just do my own thing. And so I think, I think having built brands like that, I learned that, you know, it doesn't have to be in fashion. It can be in anything. Mm -hmm. So I took all those skills, you know, the hard and soft skills, and I just applied it to, I mean, pretty much, I mean, there's such a been been such a variety of clients that I've worked with, you know, so it's kind of the, it's all really about finding out who the target audience is and building concepts, language around who that person is. Right. And uh, did you end up attending fashion shows and presenting your, your, uh, your fashions at these shows? How did that? I, I was, I mean, well, I was, I was a denim designer mostly. I mean, not, not that that was the only, but that was my, um, my specialty was denim. And so I did attend a lot of denim shows, um, you know, fashion shows for the, for the uh, companies that I designed for. Sure. Gotcha. That was a fun industry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How did you get into it? Like, what's your origin story there? Oh, goodness. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's feels like it was so far. So it's so far away that it's even hard to understand, but I feel like it's just something that was always part of my life. You know, my grandmother was a seamstress. So like for me, sewing was just like, I thought everybody did that. You know, like I grew up thinking, you know, everybody sews. My grandmother actually raised me. So um, I think you and I have a similar situation yeah. with that. Yeah, my grandmother um, raised me too for uh, most of my early childhood. Yeah. Yeah, my grandmother, and my grandpa raised my sister and I. And so, you know, she was of the Depression era. So, like, you know, she had a sewing machine in the living room. And she would always sew things and she'd sew things for me. And so I just assumed, hey, everybody sews and, you know, everybody sews. So I grew up, you know, putting things, putting garments together, sewing, you know, I was always really creative anyways. And, um, you know, I think at age 12, I came up with my first denim line. It was, 
Wow. It wasn't serious, but it was like, you know, it was a, it was, you know, and I was kind of obsessed with, you know, fashion and brands as a child, you know, I, I knew which car brands I loved and I knew which clothing brands I loved even as a child. So I think it was just, I don't know why, but I think it's just the designer's eye um, that just kind of is attracted to certain things like that. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I grew up just thinking everybody sewed. And so I sewed and I started making clothes for, for people, you know, kind of like one-offs. And then I started a swimwear line back when the internet was still very, very young. I built my first website in Dreamweaver. All right. I remember that. <laughs> I remember right? Dreamweaver. This is back when like Homestead was a thing and yeah, um, I actually, like Homestead I, websites. Homestead was a yeah. client back in the day. Yep. I helped them with their SEO yeah. in the very early days. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I started, I started, so it was kind of funny when I think about, you talk about the origin story. I was, I was um, sewing clothes and trying to launch and then using the internet to sell. So it's like, even back then I was still kind of merging the two together, you know, because I love the internet. I love the possibilities that it, you know, gave everybody. It was just this whole new world that was opening up. And I was, I mean, I dove in feet first. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think I think you know I started designing, I started selling, and then I would then I would go to work for somebody, you know, um, and it was just I don't know, it was just something that was always in my life, to be honest with you. Gotcha. And so, how did you incorporate content marketing and other aspects of of digital marketing in those early days into your in, into the fashion stuff that you were doing? Because I'm I'm sure there's a lot of overlap, right? Where as, there definitely was. Yeah. I mean, I learned, I learned how, I mean, I was on eBay in 1999. <laughs> and so eBay taught me SEO, like a little bit of SEO, because I learned that how I listed it in the, in the headline that I used made all the difference in the world of whether or not I was going to even be found on eBay. And so eBay, eBay taught me a lot about e-commerce, you know, and marketing online, you know, kind of in a light way. Um, but yeah, I would sell, I was kind of like Sophia Amoroso before Sophia. I think I was actually on there at the same time she was the founder of Nasty Gal. All and, right. um, yep, yep. yeah. And so, um, it was, it was, yeah, I think every, you know, thinking back on it now, everything was really overlapped, um, with me because, you know, yeah, I, I mean the internet and building websites and e-commerce, and then fashion. So it's just kind of like they work together for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, everything is uh, non-random. You know, it's, there, there are so many coincidences sure. that uh, when, when you look back and you kind of piece it all together, it's like, wow. Yeah. Everything was uh, yeah, perfectly aligned and, and meant to happen in the way that it did. I believe that. I truly do. I mean, and it's not actually until we've been talking about this now that I've actually realized that, wow, those two really were like, you know, playing with each other the whole time, you know, and I just, I always felt like they were separate. They really weren't, you know, at all. So I think I just kind of, like when it was time to stop, you know, playing with both of them and go, you know, work for a, qu a company or something, then I would, you know, put everything aside and do that. But it was just like, when I wasn't working full time for a company, it was definitely, you know, the entrepreneur side came out and, you know, marketing came out and e-commerce and, and fashion all kind of combined for me. Yeah. Well, you were a young entrepreneur uh, designing clothes and as, uh, as a preteen, did you get some press uh, through, through this process? Oh, no, 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 I wish, I wish. I mean, I, I, I look back on my life and the one thing I really wish I would have had more of was um, mentors. I just didn't. I was, I was floating around as a child who that was just had all these crazy ideas, but no, nobody to really rein that in or, or to, to funnel that in a good, good direction. So I think I was, <laughs> it was just kind of a wild, a little wild entrepreneur, crazy creative as a, you know, but. I think that had somebody been able to harness that probably would have had all kinds of things accomplished yeah. before I was 20, maybe. Yeah. And the, yeah. and the mentorship that's typically available to kids is not very impressive. Like I always uh, 
doing junior achievement for a little while as a as a teenager in in high school and I was so unimpressed it just seemed like uh, arts and crafts or something just it was so lame it was not like working with a real entrepreneur mentoring sure. me on on how to start a business I had a friend at this uh, 13 year old he was also 13 and he had his own spring lawn sprinkler installation business and by the time he was 16 wow. he bought himself a brand new uh, Ford Mustang convertible <laughs> oh wow yeah yeah so I ended up working That's... for him a little bit uh, yeah so I I was one of the, his grunts basically digging trenches uh, that didn't last long. I, I didn't like the manual labor, but I just, uh, I was really impressed with what he had built as a, uh, as a, as a young teen. Anyway, so, wow. um, let's talk a bit more about, uh, analytics and how to glean actionable insights from things like dashboards and various, reports inside of Google Analytics, inside of Google Search Console, and maybe you're using Google Data Studio as well, and whatever other third-party tools. Like, uh, help us to find some opportunities, some some uh, uh, nuggets of gold, uh, or, or whatever the analogy is. Nuggets of gold? Oh, you mean from the analytics? Yeah, so taking all these... Uh, reports and graphs and charts and and the ability to export and sort and and filter and all that and most people their eyes just glaze over at that stuff or they sure. don't find the time to do it if they do go in there what are they going to get out of it other than just information it's really hard mm -hmm. for a lot of people to get actionable insights out of True. these reports. So maybe we could talk a bit about that. Sure. I mean, I use, I use a, I use a company, I think they're based out of the Netherlands. I'm not sure they're called Swido. I don't know if you've heard of them. I have not, but they kind of, it's, it's kind of a, I mean, they're, for me, they're kind of gold. It's not, it's not always the same as using Google analytics, which is solely what I use. Um, and then I can write reports based on what I find in there, but every client is different and they all kind of want to know different metrics. And so, but I use Swido because it kind of pulls everything in from say like their ad campaigns on Facebook or Google ads. Um, it tells, it tells us which, you know, social media posts perform the best, you know? And so it kind of gives us like a, it's kind of like an overview of how the month went, you know, and, and it shows, you know, what performed really well, you know, how many, how many followers did you gain this month? You know, how many did you lose? Um, it's just, it's really, that one's a really nice tool for kind of the overall scope that I use. Um, but when it comes to Google analytics, it really depends on, it really depends on the client and what they're measuring. So if it's like a Shopify um, client account, obviously what they're going to want to know is our sales higher this month than they were last month. And Shopify does have its own um, insights, you know, but it's not, I don't know if it's quite as detailed as Google analytics might give me. Um, but I think for me, what I like to pay attention to most is, is the content that I'm creating actually, is it performing? Is it, is Google paying attention to that content? Is it bringing in more organic? Because for me, like we can set ads all day long, but I think at the end of the day, what I like to see is how is their site performing organically? I mean, because this is money that they don't have to spend on Google ads because a lot of times I feel like organic outperforms Google ads, you know, mm -hmm. especially if people are looking for certain pieces of content, you know, they're not going to click on an ad because they're going to feel like they're going to get fooled into. <laughs> so I think what I look for the most is how are we performing organically? Is the content that we're producing working you know, and you can see that month over month and Google um, search console can help us a little bit with that, but just the pages. Um, if you, if you look, um, if you expand the pages in Google analytics, you can kind of see which pages get hit on the most, you know, how long people spend on that page. That tells me a whole lot about, is this the content they're actually looking for? You know, 
Um, and some do really, really well. And sometimes it's just a bounce out. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe that was just a bot or it didn't answer the, the question right away or whatever. It wasn't what people were looking for. But I love it whenever I can see that, you know, people spend some time on a page and maybe they click into another page too while they're at it. And so that to me is, you know, overall, that's, that's a positive metric, whether it's a, you know, e-commerce site or, you know, just content. Sure. Are you familiar with Microsoft Clarity? I should be, it's, but I'm not. Okay. Well, it's, uh, until this year, I wasn't familiar with it either. It's free, just like Google Analytics is, and they said that it's going to continue to be free indefinitely, like uh, permanently. And it's user experience analytics. It's different from Google Analytics in that you mm. can see when people are scrolling or not scrolling, if they're doing what's called rage clicking. Like, hey, this thing is oh, supposed to be clickable, and I keep clicking on it and it doesn't do anything. You know, that sort of is stuff. Is it a little like hot? hot jar yeah essentially it's like hot jar or, okay yeah yeah those are that those are definitely very interesting tools as well you can kind of see you know where where everybody clicks mostly and i mean obviously everybody knows that the upper right hand corner is a hot spot on most websites so that's why the you know contacts or call to actions are always seem to be on the upper right hand side but it's really interesting to see how far they scroll down you know, you know is all your best content up top because that's where most people spend their time anyways, it seems. So yeah, that's a that's a really interesting one too. I'll have to check out yeah, yeah, Microsoft Insight. Microsoft Clarity, yeah. Clarity? Mm-hmm. Clarity. Yeah. I'm going to have to write this down. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, a, it's a really cool tool. I, I played with it after hearing about it at PubCon this year. I uh, spoke at it, and one of the keynotes was, was uh, the program manager for Microsoft Clarity. It was compelling. So I had never hmm. played with it prior to hearing about it at that conference. Yeah. How about other tools for uh, like SEO and for paid search and so forth? Like for example, um, for Ahrefs SEO, or what, what are you using? I have used that. Um, you know, SEO for me is... And this is a funny, funny subject for me, I know, because you're the SEO expert. Um, so I feel strange talking to you about any SEO. Well, you're talking to but, the listener. <laughs> right. we're, but, we're having a, yes. a very personal conversation with the listener, uh, talking into their ear right now. Sure. You know, SEO is a funny, funny world. Um, I've used SEM Rush, um, HF refs I've used briefly. Um, you know, obviously when I write, you know, if it's in, if it's in a uh, WordPress site, I use Yoast because that helps a lot. Yep. Um, I think, I think most people who have a WordPress site and they're writing content, I think they should definitely use Yoast. It'll help them. It'll train them, you know, just kind of the basics. Um, so you're talking about yeah, like uh, when you're writing an article or blog post and it tells you if you're, um, incorporating it, the keywords and so forth into the copy. Yeah, it does help. It, it helps to, it helps to get it nice and um, organized. I think, I think for somebody who doesn't know any kind of SEO using something like Yoast is definitely a, a, a positive tool to use, mm -hmm. you know, and it, obviously you can't, I don't think you can use it for anything other than WordPress, but, um, right. but yeah, it's, if it's, it's pretty, it's pretty important to use if you're just starting out. Yeah. Yeah, I have every WordPress site uh, in, uh, with Yoast installed. And, and by the way, uh, Yoast Devok was on this podcast. That was a great episode, deep diving into WordPress SEO. So listener, oh, nice. check that out. I'll include it in the okay. show notes too. Yeah. And what about uh, Moz? Are you using Moz at all? Yeah, I've used I've used Moz as, as well, mm -hmm. but you know it's 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 one of those things where for me SEO is, and and I know it's changing all the time because Google's you know Google's Google changes often and things like that. But what I've learned the most, and this is just from my point of view, but what I've learned the most from SEO is to not overthink it too too much. Um, 
I've learned that just creating really good quality content and having having that content structured properly and concentrating on using your right the right headlines, the H1s and the H2s, and structuring it, having images that have the alt tags. You know, I think I think what Google looks for the most is just quality content. And so I think people should concentrate more on on writing quality content, but not forgetting about the keywords they're trying to um, to to grab, you know? And I think what what happens that I have learned personally is whenever you're creating quality content that is SEO um, driven is that other people will start linking to your your content. And so when you've got other authoritative sites linking to your content, it tells Google, oh, this is a quality piece of content because, you know, Vimeo just linked to it or somebody like that just linked to it. And so I, I think for me, I try not to overthink too much of all the nuts and bolts, all the internal portions of SEO. And, and you know, I write something and if, I, if it doesn't start indexing, because most of the stuff that I write, it indexes uh, on some of the sites that I work on pretty quickly because some of those sites are really old and they're, you know, if you're constantly updating, you know, it, it'll, it's kind of like that. Um, it, it just becomes, you know, it, it, it's just alive, I guess, for Google. And they know that, you know, these people are always pumping out quality content. So, you know, usually whenever I create something, it, it populates pretty quickly onto Google. And if it doesn't, that's whenever I start digging in and I start thinking, okay, why is it not? What's, what am I doing wrong here? Am I, am I trying to capture something that's not relevant? Am I trying to capture something that's too, too difficult? You know, and then so I try to, then I try to edit it. But I think I try not, whenever I go into it, I don't overthink it right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know that's probably not great advice for most people who want to, who want to implement, you know, more SEO into their website. But, um, I think the, the key is creating quality content. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I would even uh, take it a step further and say, make it remarkable content. And, and Seth Godin in The Purple Cow talked all about remarkability, worthy of remark mm -hmm. is, is his definition of remarkable. And uh, if, if that's your standard that you're working towards, it's not just going to be, this is a really solid piece of content, but no, this is worthy of remark. That's like your North Star. And I, right. I do like what you're saying about don't overthink it because you can tap into your intuition without having to use all the tools like BuzzSumo or whatever else to figure out what to write about. Mm -hmm. you, you just access the universal Google, as my wife calls it. You know, it's like mm -hmm. <laughs> your intuition, your, uh, uh, your, your sixth sense. I'm like, okay, what am I going to write about that's going to make a difference and help people right. and be something that's worthy of sharing, of linking to, of, of uh, reading the thing fully and not just doing a quick skim over it. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, and, and yeah, I guess that for me, it's like, I think about the stuff that, you know, comes to me. It's like, I kind of want to know this information too. So if I want to know it, it must mean that there, there's probably other people out there who do too, you know? And so a lot of times I've written content for myself and, you know, and, and it's funny because when I write, sometimes I feel like it's coming from somewhere else. And so it's really interesting. And then whenever I press the publish button, you know, I realize when I read it, it's like, did I, did I write this or did, <laughs> did somebody else write this? Um, but, but yeah, that's another form of using, you know, your intuition, I guess. And just kind of like being in that, that flow whenever it's just coming through and, and coming out. So I think, I, and I think everybody has the ability to do that, you know, Yes. But it's, um, yes. Everybody. But whenever you feel it, yeah. Everybody has intuition. In fact, everybody is is psychic, and most people mm -hmm. would argue with you on that one and say that. Well, I've yes. never had any uh, paranormal experiences or whatever. Uh, but the thing is, is if you go with your gut, it's not just your subconscious, or maybe it's not even your subconscious at all. It's it's like your angels or your higher self 
whispering into your consciousness. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, when you say it's, I don't even know where that's coming from, what I just wrote, it could be from, yeah, your, your uh, higher self source. and from source, from, from your angels, from your guides, but mm -hmm. it's not just your brain. <laughs> it's not just you coming up sure. with this stuff. I, I, I believe that completely. Yeah. I've right. I've had lots of experiences of that too. So I'm, I have corroborated corroborating evidence uh, uh, enough that I'm I'm convinced. Uh, I don't need right. to convince everybody else. The diehard skeptics can do whatever they want, but um, I know it works for sure. me. Right. Yeah. So what right. what are some of the aspects of content marketing that you think are neglected or not done uh, well? Um. Oh, I'm trying to think. Uh, well, there's so many different types of content marketing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we'll take a I few examples, like, like uh, the different content types, like videos, infographics, uh, uh, well, written content pieces. I love video, and I don't think enough. I don't think enough brands are doing video, mm -hmm. and that's the one thing I push the most whenever I I meet a new client. I'm like, we got to do video. We got to do video. <laughs> And most people shy away from it. They don't want to be on, they don't want to be on camera. They don't want to talk. They don't want to be a part of that, that brand, you know, image. And, but um, I feel like that's kind of, I mean, it's definitely where we're going. Um, I think every brand, every business is going to have to just bite the bullet and start making more video. I think more video content is definitely, you know, lacking yeah. there's plenty of there's plenty of articles out there plenty but i think for the people out there who want um they're more visual you know maybe they want to you know instead of read about something maybe they, or even podcasts if they want to hear about how something is done you know or information that way yeah well speaking so. of podcasts i didn't used to do video i had audio only podcasts for the first few years it wasn't until i don't know like 20 19 or so that I started uh, taking video as well and uh, posting that to my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And it's been really great. I've had uh, some you know, 30,000 view episodes that, you know, that's, that's a lot of watch time added to my mm -hmm. YouTube channel. And if I hadn't been publishing those uh, videos um, to my YouTube channel, I, I wouldn't have gotten that. So I had prior to that uploaded, or my team did this, uploaded some um, basically audio only episodes to my YouTube channel, but that's not really, that doesn't uh, kind of hit the mark because it's a still image. Or maybe it's a, a waveform of the audio or something, and it's not really that engaging. It's not like watching a couple of people having a conversation. So if you're right. going to publish your YouTube, uh, your, your podcast episodes on YouTube, definitely record the video of, mm -hmm. of you and the guest. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that. Yeah. So what would be an example of a video that you think is fantastic content marketing? Uh, I'll, I'll first give my example. It comes to mind that I love. It's Casey Neistat and it's do oh. what you can't. That's, I think, his featured video on his uh, uh, channel homepage. And it's so well produced and it's such great storytelling. It's so inspiring. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's great. Very memorable, very remarkable. He, yeah, he is good. I've, I've actually watched a lot of his videos and he is very inspiring. Yeah. Um, I haven't watched anything of his in a long time, but... Um, I always go to Gary Vaynerchuk. Mm -hmm. The guy is just a monster for content. He is prolific. <laughs> and I mean that in all the best ways. Um, but he, he I would say out of, out of a lot of the people that I've heard recently, he's probably pretty one of the most inspiring persons I've, I've had a chance to listen to. And there's no frills. You know, he doesn't, um, you know, it's, 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 but it's but the, the the message is so is so good you know and he has such a way of you know moving people into action and i think 
you know, I think his video content is just great. Even just stuff off the fly. Like he's in the back of a cab and he decides, Hey, I'm going to make a video right now. He does a lot of that. Just just the, just the very um, personal. um, He has such a very personal touch with all of his fans, followers, Gary, Gary nation, I guess they're called Vayner nation. Um, But yeah, I think I, I really, I really appreciate the way he connects with people through his content marketing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you have a favorite video of like his? You're... Um, I've watched so many. The one that stands out in my mind was actually though, I mean, he, cause he's always making so much content, but one that stands out in my mind was one of the first keynotes uh, speeches he did. And I can't remember exactly where he was. But it was so profound to me that I changed everything that I was doing at that point. This was probably three and a half, four years ago. And it was, yeah, it was a keynote speech. I want to say he was, he might have been in Amsterdam. I'm not sure, but it was a keynote speak, uh, a speaking engagement he had. And it was, yeah, it was incredibly profound and it just, it kind of changed the course of everything I was doing at that, at that time. Hmm. So looking back, you know, how there are no coincidences, we talked just briefly about that. Um, how did that uh, kind of plug in as a puzzle piece into uh, so well into your, your life at that time and, and and in hindsight, you're like, wow, that, that was exactly what I needed. And, uh, yeah. Source hooked me up, yeah. right? <laughs> Cause that's how that? source hooked me up. Like got me exactly the it's... thing I needed at that moment to, uh, leapfrog or, or jump to the next level. It did. I mean, I think I realized at that moment that I was, I think there was a time when he he mentioned in the in the speech that there's going to be some things that you're really good at, and when you find out what those are, you triple down on it. But you're not going to be able to be good at everything. And I think I went my whole life trying to be good at, you know, both the fashion and the the marketing. And it's like I had to choose one. And I realized, you know, I think it's time to just let this full time fashion career go you know, just completely cut it off and not necessarily just burn the bridge, you know, but it was time to make a decision. And I, um, I, I realized that I hadn't made a clear and defined decision in my life and in my career. I was always teetering on both. And, you know, when you do that, you find that you only can give a certain percentage to each one instead of 100%. And so I realized by letting that go and it not being like all of my efforts or even 50% of my efforts that I was going to be able to give 100% of my efforts to something that I was also really good at too and that challenged me more. And so for me, it was marketing. I was like, okay, I'm letting, I'm going to let that fashion, just that whole thing just go. And I'm going to, you know, put everything in boxes. I put it all up in my attic like out of sight, out of mind, it was done. It was, the decision was, was done. That was it. And the moment that I concentrated everything on just marketing, like, like my career income, everything just exploded after that, because what I had been doing was just, you know, putting a little bit here, a little bit over here, a little bit over here and expecting a hundred percent of results. And it was just not, it wasn't happening. And so, yeah, I think that was kind of that turning point for me was realizing I had to, you know, make a decision. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, what we're really good at prevents us from being in, in our, our zone of genius. If we're not doing only our unique ability or our zone of genius as much as possible, we're holding ourselves back and we're, we're not fulfilling our destiny. So that zone of excellence is deadly, right? The, the Gay Hendricks talks about the zone of excellence versus the zone of genius. And if you're hanging out in the zone of excellence, you're really good at this thing, but it's not 
your gift. It's not your mission. It's not what lights you up. It's not what um, you're here for. You gotta let it go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, I think after a while, the fashion just started feeling too, um, I don't know. It, it was just maybe shallow is, is the word. It wasn't really giving anything back into the world. Mm. You know, it wasn't. And, and then, you know, then I thought to myself, well, is marketing? Is, is marketing giving anything back? And then I realized in some ways it is because what I've, what I've done and what I've helped people to achieve you know, it's, it's dreams and goals and it's not just helping them with building a business. It's, you know, it's, it's their whole livelihood, you know, it's like, and I believe that when everybody is thriving, you know, like that's kind of where we all need to be. Yeah. Like we, everybody needs to be thriving and everybody needs to be successful with their business or whatever they're doing, their career, you know, and, and earning what they deserve and what they want to be earning. Yeah, I remember Tony Robbins uh, saying that all there is in business is innovation. And I remember Tony Robbins uh, saying uh, at the, all, all that exists in business is innovation and marketing. And if you simplify it in that way, like what uh, Tony describes, then marketing is a critical component to making the world a better place because business is what makes a lot of the well, yeah, things happen in the world and sure. you with your marketing genius are able to assist brands that are making a difference in the world to reach more people and make more of an impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, It's true. It's true. And I always wondered like, how do these two, you know, work together? How does this, you know, how do I, how do I, bridge this you know and i realized the more people i met you know most of my clients you know we can still email each other and um we have great relationships so it's more it, it's been more for me about building relationships than it is just about you know business as usual yeah yeah and it's pretty wild to think that people in your lives are there for a reason including your clients, even clients that um, didn't work out. They're uh, there to help you on your journey and you're uh, also there to help them on their journey, right? So we're all just at the end of the day, walking each other home as, as Ram Das mm -hmm. would say. So if, yep. if you could um, think of an example, you don't have to say the name of the client, but is there somebody that comes to mind that's like, wow, that was um divinely inspired or that that was an incredible synchronicity that happened in, in relation to a, a client or even just a prospect and something that you were able to achieve or they were able to achieve you guys needed each other and it wasn't even just like a client it was somebody who was assigned to you in this life oh yeah absolutely there's one that stands out in my mind hundred um, percent. She's a, uh, she's actual, she's actually a spiritual coach for coaches. She's um, amazing. And the way we just kind of uh, came together was just uh, through a, through a mutual friend. And um, she was kind of struggling with some things um, with her website. And, you know, I understood where, you know, where she was at. And it was just like, I think it was four or five months of working together. And what we were able to do together was just amazing, you know? And I felt like it was very cosmic. Mm -hmm. It didn't feel like anything that was, it felt very meant, meant to happen for me. And I think for her too, even you know, we're very, I felt very connected to her. So it was a very nice experience. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I have one example that comes to mind uh, for me it wasn't a, a client; it was a prospect. But um, you, yeah, you can't make this stuff up. It's just uncanny. He had just heard forty-five minutes prior to our uh, our sales call. He heard Tucker Max and Dan Sullivan talk about me in in a recording, and or it was a a webinar or something. 
Well, maybe it was podcast, but it wasn't about SEO at all. It was about how to write a book. And Tucker Max was talking about you know, if you're going to write a memoir, then you know you, you're you're going to be the only one with your story. So no problem. You you don't have a lot of competition in, in the traditional sense. But if you're going to write a nonfiction book and you're going to write about let's say SEO, well you're going to go on head to head with Stephen Spencer in his thousand page SEO book, and that's not a good idea. You need to niche down to something that is um, not going head to head with somebody who's already got an established uh, plot of land like that. And and he heard that 45 minutes prior. What are the odds? <laughs> what are the right. odds? So there's so many synchronicities and, and uh, quote unquote chance occurrences that aren't chance. Uh, it's magical. Right. I love it. It is. Yeah, I call them breadcrumbs. Yeah. Yeah. You know, exactly. Yep. Just follow the intuitive breadcrumbs. And, and, and don't yes. go against your intuition. That always leads to a mess. <laughs> Learn that the hard way. It does. It does. You know, it, it really does. And I think, I think for most people, it's like you have to decide if it's intuition or if it's fear-based. You know, it's like when you got a nagging feeling, is it, is it a fear or is it, is it your own thought or wh- where is it coming from? I think, I think when, when people start to kind of train that portion of their of their mind, they, they can kind of understand what's theirs and what's something else. Mm-hmm. You know, for me, it becomes a thing where you have to do this. And it feels like somebody just, just like, it feels like my grandfather sometimes nagging at me, like do this, do this, do this, because that's the kind of personality he was. And so like, you know, it's for me, they, sh- you know, anything that I, that I feel is intuitive, it, it shows up in very strange languages, I guess, or, or in, in just very strange ways. And I know it's not coming from my own, you know, fear-based thought or whatever it might be, or yeah, for sure. it's, it's sometimes it feels really um, impulsive, you know, and I have to sit with that for a moment and say, okay, you know, before I do something impulsive, let's, you know, kind of think this out a little bit, you know, but, but I think, I think for everybody, it's really about kind of becoming in tune with those inner voices and knowing what's what's what yeah yeah just uh you can ask you can ask is this is this coming from the light (laughs) and if it's not uh they can't answer it is yeah right yeah well that's a fun way to end this episode if uh, our listener is is interested in working with you and uh, having your your marketing magic applied to their business how do they get in touch uh, just avacarmichael.com. Awesome. And what's your most active uh, social platform? Probably Instagram. Okay. And it's Ava Carmichael. Uh, it's just Ava Marie Carmichael. Ava mm-hmm. Marie Carmichael. Okay. I'll put those links also into the show notes while my team will. <laughs> so awesome. Thank well, you. thank you, Ava. And thank you, listener. I hope you go out there and make some uh, impact and other people's lives and do good marketing. And we'll catch you on the next episode of Marketing Speak. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off.